So I had a plan, but it did not go well. Uh, I ended up with way too many slides, so I tried to, to just remove a lot. So now I, I'm only, I only have like many, many, many slides, so I'll just skip over some and stay on some, okay? I'm kind of sick, so I may be rushing out at some point, but uh, if that happens, I, I will be back, okay? So I'm Gilles uh, from the OpenBSD project. I'm also known as Pool.org on uh, Twitter and GitHub. I come from the city of Nantes in the um, west coast of uh, France. I've been using OpenBSD for about 20 years, and uh, I'm an OpenBSD developer for uh, 10 years now. I've also been using uh, other, other, other BSD systems, mostly when I was a student, and I, I kind of like the philosophy of all BSD systems. I still have a um, kind of a special place for OpenBSD in my heart, so that's why I use it uh, every day. I started working on SMTPD in 2007 as a personal project, uh, absolutely not involved with uh, OpenBSD. Uh, then uh, Henning, uh, Reich, and uh, Pierre-Yves uh, kind of tricked me into turning it into OpenSMTPD, telling me that it would be a nice project, which it is, but uh, it took kind of longer than expected. Um, so. <laughs> Um, I'm currently a lead developer for the Vent Privé Group, which is a platinum sponsor for the event. I will not do a lot of advertising for the company, but I still have to say their name at least twice so that they will send me to other events. Uh, we are hiring, um, including in my team, so if you're looking for a job, just mail, okay? Uh, I used to work in uh, the main industry, doing uh, research and development. Um, I kind of distanced myself from uh, from this industry, so I would be able to work on stuff that would not uh, be in contradiction with what I do at work. Um, Vent Privé has a few open SMTB, SMTB instances. Uh, I was not aware, I was not in, involved in the choice, and I was not hired to work on this, so I just had to, to learn from uh, Mike, which is here. I asked him uh, if we were actually running it, and he told me yes. We have a few OpenBSD installs, but uh, kind of uh, just for file, I think. And, uh. The other people in the OpenSMTP crew are Eric, uh, which is uh, somewhere here, uh, Sonil, uh, Jung. We also send uh, our disks to Todd Miller for, uh, just for review. And we've received a few contributions from the community, but sadly, mostly from uh, the Linux community. We don't receive many contributions from other BSD systems. And there are not so many stable contributors. Um, people often just send a diff, then move away. So we are kind of a small crew, because uh, even uh, ourselves would not uh, always have the time to, to work full-time on, on SMTPD. So what is SMTP and open SMTPD? A very fast uh, overview. First, SMTP is a simple, supposedly simple protocol to exchange messages between uh, machines on, well, on the internet, but not only on the internet. Uh, it only takes charge the, the transfer, not the retrieval of messages. So it's just um, a way to send a message from a, a machine A to a machine B. Then the user, the end user, has to retrieve the message through another means, usually a pop, a pop, IMAP, and, and the such. Uh, it relies heavily on the DNS protocol, uh, so you can't really have mail without DNS. And um, you can see the, the SMTP network as a kind of graph, where each uh, mail exchanger is a node on the graph acting either as a relay, uh, receiving a message and forwarding it to a different place, or as a destination for the message. Or they can reject it, but that's a kind of different policy. Uh, the goal of Anemix uh, is, is to route a message closer to the destination. Um, and usually what will happen is that it will see the next point, the next node as its own destination and doesn't, doesn't necessarily know what's behind, okay? So I uh, kind of stole this from uh, Eric's presentation a few years ago. Uh, this kind of shows like you have the user foo which sees relay as an exchanger, which sees another relay as an exchanger, Etc. until it reaches my own uh, relay there. And at each point, the, the relay doesn't know what's behind the next hop, okay? Uh, in addition, uh, the RFC imposes uh, responsibility over messages, so you have to be uh, kind of uh, uh, very careful about what you do with messages. You just can't uh, lose a message that you have accepted. 
So in the protocol, you, you will have an acknowledgement to the client that you will have, that you have accepted the message. As soon as you have sent that acknowledgement, you're not allowed to lose the message. You have to do something about it. So if the message gets lost for some reason, you have to at least acknowledge the original sender that it was lost, okay, for some reason. Um, each node uh, that uh, that has an error has to be the one that uh, acknowledges the original sender. So it doesn't, uh, I mean, trickle back on all previous nodes. It should just you have to pass just enough information for the the last node to know how to uh, notify the initial sender that something went wrong. And it's the best interest of every um, uh, postmaster to to get rid of the message as soon as possible because uh, for many reasons. Uh, the, the first one is that you don't want to be the, the node that lost the message due to a disk crash or anything. So if you get a message and can test it really fast, it's, uh, it's your best policy. But there are also other reasons due to, to the fact that uh, if, you, if you retain messages for longer, you have to have the hardware to do it and it has a, a, a cost. Uh, for uh, at least big uh, mail extension, it has a cost. And one thing that, that's uh, less known is that the SMTP protocol is a transactional protocol. Uh, an accepted message is actually a commit. So, oh, it reads fine. Uh, this is a kind of a session. So we have the first phase where we just uh, saying hi to the, to the peer. Then we have a transaction that actually starts at the mail from line. All the recipients are part of the same transaction. They will share a common uh, transaction identifier. There's a message that's been uh, passed in the, in the transaction. Then there's the server acknowledgement that the message was accepted. And this assigns a transaction ID, okay? All the recipients will share the same transaction ID, which is often known as a message ID, but can be, there can be differences in implementation. So a session, it spans from the connection to disconnection, and the transaction spans from the, from the mail from to uh, end of messages, but it also can be interrupted. And well, you, are, you, are, well, you can uh, have it interrupted by the server itself or for whatever reason, maybe a lack of disk space or anything. And you can have it uh, interrupted by the client with some, uh, some comments like mail to issue a new transaction or R set which uh, does a reset. Uh, all the recipients share the same common uh, message identifier, that's uh, what I said earlier. Uh, they will all receive the same copy of the message. There will not be a uh, duplication. The, the data part of the, of the session uh, will contain the exact same value for every mail that had the same transaction ID. And you can have multiple transactions within the same session. You just have to go through another phase of uh, mail, mail form. So what is open SMTPD? It's a uh, general purpose uh, implementation of the SMTP protocol. It does both the server side and client side part of the protocol. Uh, in the server side protocol, uh, server side uh, implementation, what it does is accept messages coming from the network or local socket. Uh, and insert it in, in its queue to relay or deliver. And as a client, it operates as a, a client taking a message from the queue and forwarding it to another place. Uh, we don't, uh, well, it has some other duties but that, that we'll see in the other slide. Uh, it doesn't follow the OpenBSD release cycle, uh, but it varies to it. Uh, what that means is that we don't have a release every six months because uh, at some point we had the time to do it and now there, there aren't enough changes to, to justify a release every six months for us. Uh, but when we have a release, we just wait for the OpenBSD release to release it at about the same time. And uh, we carry the same uh, versioning, yeah, kind of the same versioning. Uh, so summarizing the few lines, is that it accepts message from a Unix socket or the network. It does some resolving of the addresses it received in the transaction. Um, it manages a local queue of messages that we are not allowed to, to lose. It schedules messages for uh, delivery. It has some uh, retry logic uh, in case there are temporary uh, errors that, uh, that require to retry. Uh, it relays messages to other hosts over the network or it delivers messages locally uh, by executing a mail delivery agent with the user privileges. Uh, mail delivery agent is, is whatever application that can read on the standard input and put the content somewhere for the user. 
Um, okay, we have a nice community with uh, very helpful people on IRC and uh, mailing list. Uh, we've been packaged to many systems. Um, we honestly uh, don't keep track of this, uh, mostly because uh, uh, Eric is kind of sound and I'm kind of sound too, so we often learn that we are ported to a distribution because we have a maintainer joining the channel and asking us for help with the packaging. So that's how we, I discovered three distros that I didn't know even exist uh, just because they joined the OpenSMTP community. Uh, something that nice is that people are starting to to choose um, to choose to at least try OpenSMTP whenever they start a new mail server and they are uh, exper experimenting with the different solutions. Uh, that was not the case uh, two years ago or two or three years ago. I, I kind of still uh, go to forums to see what uh, what are the main complaints uh, from users about the project. And I, I kind of see now people suggesting to try PostFix and OpenSMTPD uh, as um, well. It, this kind of uh, recommendation has increased over the two last years. Uh, we have a benefit of simplicity. Uh, whenever uh, the user trying experimenting with the MTA has a very simple use case, and uh, we perfectly fit the use case. They tend to choose uh, SMTPD just because the configuration file is so easy that uh, well, people are lazy, so that's how it works. And sometimes we like a feature, and people go back to another MTA, but that's okay for us because we prefer to have people coming to open SMTPD because they are satisfied with what they get than trying to get everyone at any cost and have them just swamp us with a feature request. So it's been a while. Uh, the last talk was made by Eric in 2013 at uh, Azure BSD uh, This is when we announced our uh, first production release. And we did not have uh, any uh, official uh, uh, talk since then. Uh, we had uh, sponsorship and worked on uh, OpenSMTPD full time back then, which was uh, kind of uh, comfortable because we could um, just dive into anything uh, as complex as it was, knowing that we would have the time to finish it. Uh, I can't, uh, I honestly can't list what we did, but there's been like 40, you know, 4,000 commits on huge areas, uh, refactors that, that would have never taken place if we did not know that we had at least a month of, uh, of free time to work on it. Um, to provide a bit of context, uh, with Eric, we were working on a scalable MCA for an ESP. So an ESP is uh, an email company sending emails for good and bad people. Um, so we were dealing with a lot of, of uh, traffic. Um, they had a very complex um, infrastructure based on Postfix. And they uh, contacted me because they wanted to know if, if first we could simplify the infrastructure and uh, second, if we, we could scale to the current infrastructure. What they had it was about uh, 30 Postfix servers, but it was not for performance reason. It was just that the setup was so complex that the easiest way was to split it into many, many instances. So uh, we did a lot of uh, ping pong exchanges to see what they needed and everything. And we ended up with, um, with the first uh, proof of concept using OpenSMTPD, uh, which could replace the configuration file uh, with a simple 20 line configuration file, which was like a huge improvement uh, for them. And uh, we proved that uh, we could completely scale to the same volumes uh, as they did with the 30 Postfix instances uh, versus one of an SMTB instance. But uh, we had to optimize and make a lot of cleanup because we were not production ready when the sponsorship began. And uh, we were kind of scared that they would put it and we had, we had to fix things live. So uh, four months uh, later, the, the people operating the, the infrastructure, they, they just were confident enough to start replacing uh, the instance with uh, OpenSMTPDs. Open so that was quite nice for us because we had the first uh, real, ca real case of uh, large volume uh, uh, setup uh, sending uh, mail to just everyone on the internet. So all the cases of, uh, of broken RFC uh, implementation. After a year and a half, we decided that 
the general purpose NTA, like OpenSMTD or post it or Sentinel, was not the proper, uh, the proper tool uh, for their job, which is not to accept a lot of mail, but uh, rather to uh, uh, route a lot of mail to the internet. Uh, I'll go fast on the reasons, but uh, there's a lot of overhead with trying to not lose mail and to be atomic in commits uh, inside the queue when the, the actual use case doesn't even need to have this. So we had to make a choice uh, with Eric. Either we tried to make OpenSMTP fit so we could keep the sponsorship going, uh, which was not, not dishonest, but not really best in our best interest or uh, just tell them, okay, let's end the sponsorship. We write a custom tool for you and we keep uh, OpenSMTPD a general purpose uh, NTA. So that's the things we did. Uh, it was not even a debate. We, we really had a discussion on the phone for five minutes and we both agreed that you now the best interest for the project is just to end the sponsorship and uh, keep, uh, keep OpenSMTPD unimpacted by uh, design choices. So uh, during the sponsored OpenSMTP de development, we ran in a very high volume uh, environment, which, which made us hit uh, possibly any, any kind of bug uh, we could imagine, from bottlenecks to, uh, to servers uh, not completely respecting the RFC or having kind of artistic interpretations of the RFC. So uh, which was nice uh, because Due to the high volume environment, uh, these kinds of bugs that we never hit uh, in our own test uh, with the open source community, uh, they would trigger in minutes. So we would uh, deploy a new version, it would break after five minutes, we would start the bugging and it was fixed. Um, and we had to optimize pretty much everything uh, from disk, uh, disk space to disk usage to CPU to memory usage, uh, etc. And uh, what was really, really nice is that uh, the sponsor completely respected the deal, which was uh, they would not interfere in how we worked with OpenSMTPD. So uh, they basically told us, make something that works. And uh, they never, never had, uh, I, I don't think someone even looked at the code uh, besides Eric and I. They just trusted us to deploy it and to fix if something was wrong. And since SMTP is uh, such a nice, um, aggressive protocol for failures, uh, we, would, we could just let it fail. Uh, find the time to, well, not too long, but we, can, we could spend a bit of time to, to think about the proper solution, implement it, and push the proper solution. So uh, everything happened um, in, the, in our main branch. So we, we, we did not have a fork. It was, uh, everything fixed for them was fixed for the community, which was uh, really, really nice. Uh, finally, about the sponsorship, uh, we had a long period of calm because uh, it was very, very intense to work full time on the, on the project. And it's very hard to go back to just working a few hours here and there because you know that you will not Something that, that should have taken five days will take uh, many weeks because we just don't have the time to, to spend on it. So it took a bit, a bit of time. It was kind of frustrating, but, um, and also we needed uh, to, to just do something that's not uh, related for a change. But uh, after a while, we, we resumed uh, work on it because there are many things that are uh, not part of their use case that are very interesting to us and that we can uh, only do in OpenSMTPD, which is a, a very nice uh, test bed for experiments. Uh, so, summary, uh, we wrote uh, that big NTA that's uh, completely not open source and not general purpose. Uh, many of the ideas uh, were brought back to OpenSMTP. There are something that, that are meaningful to us and something that, well, outside of uh, the, their own specific use case makes no sense. So, it kind of still benefits. Uh, the knowledge from that other NTA kind of uh, benefits to OpenSMTP anyway. So uh, that was something someone sent me. I like it. Uh, the goal of um, the goal of making email uh, great again. Uh, I, I tend to, to read a lot on uh, the internet. People discouraging everyone from installing their own uh, uh, mail server because it's so hard, and uh, you should install it. Uh, you should run it at uh, Yahoo, Gmail, or uh, Microsoft. And while well, I, I do believe that not everyone on earth should uh, install a mail server, 
uh, I think uh, giving all this power to three or four big companies is not a uh, nice thing. And, and if the reason why is because uh, installing a mail server is complex, we should just make it simple. So, uh, in my opinion, the design we have quite, uh, today is quite good. Um, it evolved a lot in the last few years. Um, it was not perfect, and it still is not perfect, but um, it's, the, it's the design I would use if I started today. I don't, I don't own the copyright to this, but uh, I'll ask the, the fine guy who did this. <laughs> um, so the design is quite quite good in my opinion today, and with the, also the experience of uh, writing that order and TA, and Eric has, has also written a third one, uh, if I recall correctly, uh, we, we kind of have um, enough feedback to know what, what was wrong in the initial way we, we thought about uh, mail servers. If we started today, I think I'd go with the same design. I'd change many, many things, many APIs, but the, the design, the way we split the, the processes and everything, uh, I would keep the, the way we did it today. Uh, it's an evolution. It came from many, uh, many um, incremental um, developments. Um, and we still have many way, many things we want to improve, but it's mostly today about code patterns and, and APIs. Um, we had uh, we had an audit. Uh, I think many people have uh, heard that story. Uh, I had a friend who worked at a major uh, security company and asked me if he could do an audit over a few months. And they did an audit with, which was uh, very, to me, very impressive. And uh, they found many, many, many bugs. And most of well, most of it eventually uh, turned into a denial of service on OpenBSD uh, due to uh, both the design and the security mitigation uh, mechanisms that are a part of OpenBSD. So it clearly saved us from a catastrophe. And uh, well, uh, we have uh, fixed most, well, not most, we have fixed all the critical uh, issues and we have still a, a backlog of small uh, improvements to make to prevent theoretical attacks that we are uh, still working on. And since then, we also improved further uh, with new uh, things that were introduced in OpenBSD. Uh, Theo will have a talk about Pledge, and I'll have a couple of slides about it too, uh, which, uh, which are a good way to improve the design further. So OpenSMTPD is a multi-process daemon. Uh, this is a PS output. Uh, as you see, we have three users. Uh, we have uh, seven processes. Two have bad names, but this is going to change soon. Um, this is privileged separation in action, and every process has a very well-defined uh, set of tasks to achieve. And this, this has been refined uh, over the years and refined further when we introduced Pledge, which, uh, which kind of exposed the API violation layers inside of it. So the, the, what I like about the design, uh, why I say that I would keep the same, is that because uh, each of these processes has a very, very uh, um, simple set of tasks to achieve. And it makes sense for each process. The lookup process only does lookup things. The queue process only does queue things. Uh, the scheduler only does scheduling things. And there's no uh, outpassing this. There's no access to the file system by any process that's not the queue, et cetera, et cetera. And that was not the case. This, this is uh, the evolution from, uh, from trying to make it a better design. Uh, except for the parent, there's no privileged process. Uh, we still have to have a, a, a privileged process because we bind a privileged port. We do system authentication, and we, um, when we do deliveries, we do it under the privileges of the end user. So we have to be able to drop privileges to that user. Uh, so we can get rid of it. We have some code paths that bypass the the, the privileged process. For instance, if you use, uh, say. Uh, MySQL authentication, it doesn't need to go up to the root process, so it will bypass and it will never hit the privileged process. Uh, except for lookup and parent, uh, all processes are running in the shoot. Um, we can shoot lookup because it needs access to, to, to files like uh, resolve.com and uh, possibly configuration file for, my, for MySQL or anything. 
And uh, one thing that we did not have at first, but uh, which I introduced a few years ago, was to separate the, the privileges from the queue, uh, so that if uh, a process facing the network was compromised, it would not be able to, to destroy files in the queue or open files in the queue. So we have a very uh, tight, um, uh, restricted uh, set of uh, Privileges. Uh, most communication is done through IPC. We don't share memory between processes. We used to do it many, many, many years ago, and we made an effort to, to get rid of that code and only use the iMessage framework from uh, from uh, Enning. Thank you. Um, and processes are all pledged and uh, go through the fork and reexec, as we'll see uh, shortly. Uh, most OpenSMTP core features are APIs. Um, OpenSMTP only accesses a, a very tiny interface to access, to access any uh, kind of core feature, be it the scheduler or, or the queue. Uh, it allows us to test new code. It allows people to write uh, new backends for, uh, for a subsystem. And uh, it allows this to happen without our contribution. So someone could write, uh, say, queue PostgreSQL, and run it without having to have us add the dependency to anything. So uh, I'll explain how it works. But this is the, the table backend. The table is the mechanism we use for all kinds of lookup. You have to implement config, open, update, close lookup, search operations, and then you can have uh, your own uh, lookup on your own backend. Uh, this is not really readable, it doesn't matter. Uh, the idea was to show that we have um, we have something called OpenSMTP extras with chip experiments to prove, to prove the APIs work. So this is the table uh, Redis, lookups over Redis, <laughs> lookups over Postgres, lookups over SQLite. Uh, as you see, it's, it's a main function because we build a standalone executable, so it's, it's in its own memory space. And, uh, well, the code is not really tricky. It's, it's kind of simple. And we have the same for the queue. So you can technically write a queue that's not using the file system. And uh, all you have to do is implement the 10 or, or so uh, primitives that uh, manages the lookup of envelopes and messages. So, sorry. Um, we don't know where we'll implement our next bug. Um, I, I, I honestly don't think I can write a uh, code that's bug free. So the idea is that uh, we, we have to take this into account and uh, assume that the code will, will be broken and turn this into a known problem. So how do we do this? We look at the process, say, uh, say the pony process, which uh, handles the relaying for OpenSMTPD. It faces the network. It's, it's um, kind of a serious uh, attack surface uh, for OpenSMTPD. So we will just assume uh, that an attacker will manage to corrupt everything in it and fully control the process. So what can we do to make this a known problem? So this is where we start dropping the privileges, uh, shooting it, and trying to see what iMessages can it send to other processes to do the dangerous stuff so this process doesn't have to do it. Okay, so the idea is to, to really turn a remote code execution problem into a known problem. Okay, it will not be something that we enjoy, but it will be something that will not turn into uh, uh, just a nightmare. Um, and we prefer to have a Daniel uh, to uh, remote code execution or, or privileges escalation. So if we can make a code pass detect that, that something is just not normal and abort, exit, this is the, the way we do it. Because we'd, ra we'd rather have someone tell us, oh, OpenSMTPD crash, here's the, the, the stack, we fix it, and it's gone, then having someone tell us, oh, my server got fully compromised and, well. So we try to, to uh, raise the, the bar of attacks to make it as, uh, as painful as possible for the, for the attackers. Uh, we use an example of this is we use the iMessage framework, which allows message passing between uh, OpenSMTPD. And uh, Eric wrote uh, uh, an interface that's called mproch, which adds um, types and checks over messages. So the, the iMessage uh, framework it lets you pass a structure or anything. It doesn't really verify much things about it. You can, you can add your own checks, but it doesn't do a lot of verification. We, we had uh, just a layer on top, 
So we can serialize the data that we pass in the iMessage, and so it is deserialized on the other end, and that anything that, that just doesn't deserialize correctly will, will just trigger a fatal uh, iMessage. So this is an example on the sending side. We create a message, we add an, ID, an identifier inside it, we close the message, so we mean this is the message. On the other side, we try to unpack it. If there's something left after the get ID, or if there's something left when we call the mn uh, function, it's going to abort. If we get more or less data, we abort and everything. So it's kind of tricky now to corrupt the iMessage. Um, uh, Tio introduced the pledge system for, which uh, many of you probably know by now. Uh, the idea was to classify system calls into categories of, uh, of system calls and uh, allow a process to restrict uh, which system calls would be used uh, uh, from a given point of execution. And any process violating the, the, the pledge will just be aborted uh, in a way that it can try trap. So the, the general idea for, for OpenBSD demands in general is that uh, you have a lot of setup uh, when the demand starts up. Then you have the event loop, which does only a very, very limited subset of system call. So the idea is that you enable all system code so the demand can properly set up. Then right before entering the, the event loop, you just say, no, no, now you can only do STBIO, so memory allocation. And, some of stuff, and um, this becomes a, a pattern that's really easy to follow and easy to, to develop. And uh, what what is nice about pledge, in my opinion, uh, it is that it, it it lets you see that you your assumption about what your program uh, does are, are correct. So we tend to use libraries, and we often assume that the library is doing something. And this kind of proves that your assumption is right, because uh, if you did not allow pledge to let the library do something, it will just uh, abort your process. And it can expose a uh, layer of validation that, that's you doing something in a, in a process. And the pledge list seems just a bit wrong because it doesn't uh, say the scheduler. Uh, if I have to, if I had to add uh, five system uh, pledges to that process, or something would be wrong. And if I don't add it, and the process uses it, it gets aborted. So it lets you refactor the the code to to match uh, your expectations. So we adapted pledge uh, very early, uh, thanks to Theo, who came to me and kind of kindly asked me to do the change path. Uh, we pledged most of OpenSMTP overnight, uh, but we initially did it with very, very um, permissive uh, pledges, and we started reducing as, as we could uh, refactor to new code uh, as well. And many people see pledge as a security feature, and well, this is how most people talk about pledge to me, because you, know, well, you can prevent uh, a shellcode from executing uh, something by having the proper pledge. But uh, in my opinion, it's really a, a quality feature because it lets you see that something is wrong with the design, and it lets you, uh, if you prepare your pledge beforehand, you will see that something is wrong when you start adding system calls to your process that will make the, the demon crash. So nowadays we have quite tight pledges, and uh, we even have uh, pledges that are different depending on the cut paths we are taking, because uh, we know that we will no longer need something. We can restrict further as we uh, Also, OpenBSD provides out of the box ASLR and randomized malloc. So every time you run OpenSMTP, you get a different memory layout. Um, and children uh, will make malloc calls. Uh, they will start di diverging with their malloc calls. Okay. Uh, for privilege separation, we, we still have the parent process for many many children, and they all inherit the memory layout of the parent except for the the malloc divergences. And uh, that was not a bug. That was like how we thought it should be. And uh, during a hackathon in Cambridge, Theo uh, called caught uh, Eric and I in the corridor and kind of asked us if we could just uh, re-exec the users in SMTPD after fork so that we get a new the new memory layout. So this randomizes everything again. And uh, the global structures that that, uh, that were uh, inherited by fork and no longer inherited by fork since they are overwritten with the new um, memory copy of the program. 
so it would um, avoid some possible attacks and make things more random. Um, so I thought it would be quite tricky and it fell at a very wrong time for me, but uh, Eric managed to do it really fast, which is uh, quite impressive. Uh, he just came to me with, uh, with telling me I have a small bit to show you and uh, he had done everything, so that's nice. Uh, basically, this, uh, at start of the parent process, it will just uh, do the, the, the bootstrap like it did before, and uh, instead of continuing the configuration with the inherited config, uh, configuration, uh, parse configuration, what it does is just re-exec itself with a particular uh, get up it option, so it can resume knowing where it, where it had stopped. Um, so now only the file descriptors that are required for the IPC are, um, are inherited. And uh, I think I heard Theo uh, ask us to possibly re-exec a process at runtime every now and then, so that might happen. Uh, I don't know when, but it might happen, but it's not uh, an easy diff, so. So I won't stay long on this, but this shows uh, SLR and random malloc on, uh, on OpenBSD with uh, every, every address changing. We have the same with uh, fork, which shows that some of the, say the malloc before the fork, they, they retain the same address in the child. And when you add the exec, uh, it overwrites the, cop the copy of the process in memory, so you now have completely uh, different memory layouts, which is uh, uh, nice. So I originally wanted to go through all components of OpenSMTPD because we did so much. Uh, I well, have made so many slides, I had to just uh, X most of it. And uh, we can have a chat about this uh, after, so I just talk about other things. Code quality was the uh, most important part for, for us in the last few years because uh, we were running uh, quite critical uh, infrastructure, so we had to be confident that uh, nothing broke. And also, the same code goes to the community, so if something is broken, we get uh, way too many nails, so we want to be quite assured that the code we release is okay. Um, some, uh, some errors are hard to test, uh, the exhaustion is easy, the more exhaustion is easy, this space uh, too. Uh, someone, some OpenBSD hacker uh, sent me a mail a while ago because he had a bug when, which was just not reproducible for me. He wrote to a session, but he suspended his laptop and in some weird condition, he triggered the crash of the demo, the fatal of the demo. So these kinds of bugs are, are really hard uh, for us to, to reproduce. So usually during development, we test by adding code, uh, just switch the condition, see how it breaks and, and, uh, and uh, revert it before the commit. Uh, sometimes it's much, uh, much uh, harder and not, uh, not obvious. So we can't just do this, we have to, to find other ways. Uh, Eric came up with this kind of scripting language, SMTP script, which lets you script an um, SMTP session, which uh, is nice. It's not uh, open SMTP. It's not uh, tied to OpenSMTPD, you can use this with, uh, with other implementation. Uh, it lets us test that the SMTP server side is, it has not had a regression. Uh, we tend to, we used this a lot before, we, we kind of less use it today because it's not the, ar the area we work uh, the most on now. Uh, we relied a lot on code review. Uh, we charge this and we send this to the main list and we exchange it between ourselves. We, we use uh, static analysis tools like Coverity and, uh, and C-Lung Scan Build. And we had another mechanism which I will explain in a few minutes. So this, these are the kinds of bugs that are triggered by the Coverity and Scan Build. They, they just evade uh, the, the human reading, or at least mine. Um, oops. Oops, oops. So, uh, I don't know if you guys recall this. Okay. So, we, we came with a special, a special branch in the OpenSMTPD. Uh, it was inspired by Netflix and its Chaos Monkey. Uh, I don't know if everyone knows what it is, but basically the idea is that uh, your server infrastructure is supposed to be so, uh, so reliable that you can shoot down servers at random and it should not be a problem. So, they have this tool called uh, uh, Chaos Monkey, which will just shoot down servers at random. 
And uh, I thought it would be nice to have the same thing for SMTPD because most uh, error cases are supposed to, to yield uh, uh, temporary failures for the end users. Uh, there are errors that are meant to be fatal and you can't uh, avoid this, but they are usually done at the, at the setup phase and most errors uh, during runtime are, are, are supposed to just uh, result in a temporary failure so the other MTA will try again. So, um, most system calls should be okay and uh, result in a for, uh, temporary failure. So, let's have some of them fail at random since this, sh this should not be an issue. So, I introduced this special branch with uh, two read write failures, lookup failures, memory allocation failures. I added some latencies in some, in iMessage processing just to see how it would go. And, uh, we started flooding the, the Monty branch. Okay. This, did not go well. Uh, it took me a full day to fix all possible cases of uh, the daemon exploding with these uh, little fixes. Uh, a lot of the error code files led to fatal because we assumed at the beginning it was the best way to handle them, but in many cases it was too, um, too harsh as a way to handle this particular error. So what we did was we, we first did a, a full fatal uh, audit just to check where it was. Was it in the setup process or uh, at runtime? And uh, once we eliminated a few, we started uh, resuming the monkey runs just to see if it would break again. So we, we turned a few fatal calls into temporary failures. We run the branch, we wait for it to just explode and fix and uh, try again. And this is done when you can run the the flooding for hours on this branch uh, without uh, issues. So it's not uh, rocket science. You just uh, add, I had a better implementation after, but uh, this was the one I could screenshot easily. Um, basically, I add this uh, monkey return that's uh, randomized. That's a randomized uh, error. And we add a random poses uh, at uh, specific places. And this is the kind of bugs it spots, uh, bugs that, you know, that were like one-liners that you would never see uh, because they are most uh, always in the error code case since you are triggering errors that never happen. So uh, what happened here is that uh, we didn't have this return and the switch fell back to a fatal call. So, yeah. We also use Twitter as a community phasing tool. Um, we don't do this often, but we do this at least once a year. We just make a call for people to just food us on a specific instance we have. And uh, the idea is that um, this puts a lot of pressure on the, on the instance we run. Uh, and it's, it lets us test things in a way that's uh, kind of less sane than what we do ourselves uh, on our own machines. Uh, because you have a wide range of uh, clients com connecting to you. Uh, some people write their own script, good or bad, and uh, some are using TLS, some are using uh, IPv6, some have fast or, or, small, or low connection, and uh, they don't send you the same mail, so you have uh, just absolute chaos coming to the server in an infinite loop for hours. And uh, it's quite good because it lets us spot regressions uh, quite fast. Uh, we don't do this too often because uh, even when you tell the community to stop uh, flooding, they will just continue. So <laughs> we tend to do it only when we have like a major change in SMTP layer or NCL layer and we, we can let the instance run for days without, without an issue. So our plans for the future, we have many, 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 many plans. Uh, I will not go through all of them, it's just not doable. Uh, we have tickets that are open since uh, over three years because we just don't have the manpower to, to handle them. Um, first project is to improve the configuration file. So this is the, the current uh, default configuration file, which is uh, four lines. This is the one that's shipped with uh, OpenBSD by default. Uh, it does accept mail for your machine and lets you uh, relay mail, mail outside, but it's not open for the outside to mail to you. Um, it's an old format. It's, it's basically what, what uh, was done 10 years ago uh, with minor uh, updates uh, along the way. Uh, it's very simple and most people come to OpenSMPTD because of that file. Uh, some come because of the design, etc. but most people uh, just 
see a four lines config versus a 300 lines config and they pick this one. Uh, it reads almost as plain English, so oops. Um, accept for local alliances delivered and that doesn't require too much thinking. And uh, you can easily achieve a much more complex configuration, configuration files with not so many much lines. Um, you can actually write it from scratch without editing an example file. Um, well, it gets a bit of uh, being used to it, but uh, you can easily, you don't have to have a book to, to manage to make your own config. Uh, we're not going to go through this. This is just to show you uh, a configuration file, a configuration file that I use for my own with TLS, auth, uh, multiple IP, multiple listeners, uh, DKI, DKIM, primary domains, backup domains, a list of uh, what I call the shit hole, uh, where I put people that annoy me so I don't receive their mail anymore. And, um, well, this is 15 lines, so you can, you can actually do pretty complex stuff easily. But uh, there's a flaw with this. Uh, it came from an old um, assumption that one line would be awesome and uh, it's the best solution to all problems is to have everything fit in one line. But uh, there's a difference between the condition and the action, uh, which I made in red and green so you can spot the difference. Uh, there's one thing that's handled when the mail enters the system, and there's one thing that's handled uh, when the mail is delivered. And the fact that you make it fit on one line turns this entire thing into a kind of anatomic rule, and uh, you are not no longer allowed to change it later because SMTPD would not know which rule, oh, sorry, which rule uh, you match earlier since it's no longer the same rule. So I, I won't, I won't uh, spend much time on this, but we can discuss this, but it's a tricky uh, issue. It's kind of related to, to SMTP being transactional, and the way we solved this was just not right. It works, but it requires a lot of clutch, which, which is today preventing us from making uh, many progress because we always have to work around uh, uh, so the, the idea is that we should just accept that uh, these are two separate things and that they should be split into separate concepts, uh, an action and a rule. And you, you match the rule when you enter the system and the, you match the action when you actually try to do something with the map. And this, this uh, simple indirection unlocks many, many, many problems. Uh, I used it to like reloading because it's been a Quite, uh, requ quite requested feature. Um, we have a, a very uh, bad issue today, which is that if you accept a, me a message, since we have mapped a rule when you accepted the message, you can no longer change the action uh, afterwards. So say you, you got your configuration file wrong, uh, well, envelopes that were accepted are just going to go with the old envelope, no matter if you change your configuration file. And there is no way with the current design to fix this, and this is the way to, to solve this. Um, we, we have already done most of the work with Eric to, to switch to this model. Uh, we don't intend to release this soon. Uh, we intend to skip the upcoming uh, OpenBSD release because it's too, too close for us to fully uh, get it tested. But we, we are almost like 90% done with this. Uh, it saves a lot of code. It simplifies so many layers that uh, it's just shows that the old design was not uh, correct for the configuration file. Um, as I said, we, we've been using high volume uh, environments. The, the transfer layer is quite good, good uh, with, uh, yeah, I'll be done before. <laughs> Uh, the, the layer is quite good, but uh, it's grown complex because we, we always faced new issues which had uh, like, uh, intuitive solutions which piled up until uh, we have now a complex layer that works but is a nightmare to work on. So we're going to clean up this. We had Dane, which, is what, which had been requested quite a few times. Uh, I had a pop to, to do this. It was working, but not committable because uh, I just hacked something to see if it would work, and so I need to, to bring this back to life and commit it. <coughs> and we have other features in the lookup process, but we'll discuss this later. Uh, 
quick troll on the <laughs> OpenSSL. Uh, we have Rick who wrote the RSR precept OpenSSL when they offered the hard blade feature. Uh, this moves the dangerous code outside of the process facing the network, and people are now asking for ECDSA support, so we have to do the same work, which is uh, just not trivial. Uh, we're going to be working on it, but it requires to be uh, the proper mindset to, to, to do OpenSSL code. <laughs> I have a dream to actually kill open uh, SSL direct support in OpenSMTPD uh, because having to write this to instead of this is just not right to me. I, I prefer to have the simplest code for uh, the, the TLS part. Uh, that would not mean that you can't use OpenSMTPD with OpenSSL, just that we have to have a layer to abstract. Uh, uh, we have to bring a libtls wrapper on top of uh, OpenSSL. Uh, this is not doable today without hurting our community. I often ask on the mailing list on Twitter uh, who would be affected if we do that, and if we did that, and it's still too many, too many people. And the main reason is not uh, just uh, to promote LibreSSL, which is uh, it would be nice, but that's not my main reason. The main reason is because we, we have uh, if devs uh, kind of everywhere to work around special distros that have disabled that this or that option, and because we had two or three cases of uh, they uh, they released a new update with a patch level uh, upgrade and uh, they managed to slip an APA uh, change in it, which broke for us, and then suddenly we're swamped with mail of people telling us you broke something and. We didn't change any code, but we still have to find a workaround around this. So that was the case of it that, uh, that kind of pissed me off. And filters, uh, which is what I will be ending on. Uh, the filter API is uh, something that many people have been asking. Um, it allows uh, to alter the working of, of a session, inject data and uh, inject recipients, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, people want them really badly. I keep getting messages about it, and uh, I know it's a <laughs> top priority uh, project. Uh, but the problem is not the interface. The problem is how you plug the interface on it. So it's not because we don't want to, to, to use my meter or, or anything else. It's because even if we wanted to do that, we have some uh, things that we want in the, in the API and uh, we still get to, to, to do the planning. Uh, among the many things we want in it, we want filters to run in different memory spaces, different users, uh, shrouded. Uh, we want to be able to, to interact with any user input or output. And we have pretty much all of this, but in the current design, uh, we got, we, we have something unfixable, so we decided to, to just uh, not try to hack it, but to, to find a proper solution. And the problem is mainly because everything is entangled with the SNTP state machine. So whenever, whenever you try to do something in filters, you're going to break something, and you need everyone to start looking at the, at the um, how to fix, uh, which is not uh, easy. So our plan is to go from this. Uh, Antoine Jacuto trolling us every few uh, every few days, months, with this Antoine Jacuto crying for all the trolling he did uh, in the last few months. So we will be introducing SMTPFD, which is a separate daemon, uh, basically kind of an SMTP proxy, uh, which does a main in the middle of uh, SMTP session. And it allows us to reuse all the code we, we already wrote for uh, filters, but to just have two separate state machines instead of trying to have a spaghetti one. Uh, uh, basically, it receives uh, raw lines using a small protocol. It establishes a connection back to SMTP, uh, open SMTPD, and um, SMT, open SMTPD has a, a layer controlling a client back to it. Well, I, we will have a talk because Eric is likely going to have to do a talk about this. Uh, so I won't enter too much into the detail, but this is um, this, also, this is not just an idea. We we have a, a working SMTP FD. Uh, we will publish it soon. We 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 don't want we can't release it right now, obviously, because it it did not have enough testing. It has zero zero testing. But uh, we will release it for testing uh, shortly, and our target is open BSD six free. Um, so Eric uh, just learned that he's going to be doing a talk about it. And uh, SMTPFD is not tied to open SMTPD, so uh, you can technically uh, plug it to something else. 
So finally, we have many small projects that we'll be having. So if you want an SPF feature, I want a tool to automatically have TLS at startup. And we, we are playing with uh, extended SMTP extensions to, to make some experiments. So I can discuss this with you after a few. So how to help us take the code, spot bugs, report them, contribute, uh, write new features, help close problem reports, because we have many, and many are clearly uh, not very technical. They are just, uh, they, they, they just require time. Donate to the Open OpenBSD Foundation so we can have hackathons. And you can sponsor development of features and find sponsors for development of features. So that's nice. We're still hiring. Uh, for uh, Van Privé, and that's all. <laughs>